Good afternoon and Happy New Year to you all. I hope it will be really a very healthy and more clement year than the year started off. And I hope I will be able to see all of you here on, uh, on a monthly basis in our Armenian Studies Lecture Series program. I would, before um, I begin to introduce our first speaker for the year, like to also thank CRIS, the Center for Russian and Eastern European Studies, for sponsoring this lecture. You will see um, at the entry to um, a card where we have a series of lectures. We have quite a, f a full and, I think, rich uh, variety of lectures this year. So kindly, if you'd, you're interested to follow up on, on subsequent lectures, please pick up a card um, at the entrance. Well, it's an honor for me to be introducing today Arsen Saparov. Um, Arsen Saparov works in the field of Russian and Caucasian history, stretching in time to the 19th, back to the 19th century, Russian conquests of the region, culminating in the Soviet era. And I think this is a unique characteristic of Arsen Saparov's work because most of the scholarship in this uh, uh, field doesn't have this kind of historical depth that reaches to the pre-Soviet era. So um, he is unique in his perspective that you'll be hearing about today. For the last three years, we have been lucky to have Arsen in our midst, first in 2011-2012 as a Manugian postdoctoral fellow, and since uh, then as a visiting lecturer at the Department of History. He's had a dynamic career. Um, in 2007, he received his PhD from the London School of Economics um, in international relations, and following that, he spent two years as a post postdoctoral fellow in Paris at the two very prestigious centers, the CRNS, the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, and the EHS, the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales. Those two years, as well as the three years that Arsene has been here, have been very productive as far as scholarship is concerned. He has written many articles, and he has a forthcoming book from uh, Rutledge Press entitled From Conflict to Autonomy in the Caucasus, which, is it out or is it supposed to be out? Summer. Summer. Summer, Summer 2015. Okay. We'll, we'll look forward to it. More particularly, Arsene's research focuses on Armenian history and politics through imperial and ethnic lenses, looking at the case of Armenia in concert with neighboring ethnic groups. Arsene asserts that in order to understand the historical processes in the region, it is necessary to engage in one such comparative analysis. Arsen Saparov has an inter takes an interdisciplinary approach, combining history with geography and political science. His work draws on a wide range of sources with his extensive use of primary sources in the region's languages, not only of Russian, but also of local languages of Armenian, Ozeri, and Georgian. He is poised to produce an innovative reconstruction of 19th century Tsarist maps that embody the ethnographic and political complexity on the ground. Today we will hear more on the question of the creation of ethnic autonomies in the South uh, Caucasus, comparing the South Ossetian autonomy in Georgia to the cases of, uh, the cases of Nagorno-Karabakh and Ab Abkhazia, part of a larger comparative study of the formation of frontiers in the Soviet Caucasus. Please join me in greeting um, Arsen Saparov. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Catherine, uh, for a very, very uh, warm presentation. Uh, I'll kind of jump into uh, uh, straight away into uh, what I want to 
uh, do today. Uh, as the title of this talk is uh, Razanero, uh, it focuses on a very specific period in a Caucasus and uh, looks at approximately two to four years of the history. And I thought, well, uh, this probably is interesting for a specialist, but I have to cater for a wider audience uh, and not everybody is like focusing on a period of independence and the Bolsheviks. So what I want to do today, I want to uh, start by looking at uh, the case studies, uh, uh, zoom in into these uh, issues, and then I will try to put it in a wider context of the 19th century uh, Russian Empire and its appearance in the South Caucasus, as well as I will uh, move uh, beyond into the Soviet period, and I will try to see some historical continuities and uh, connections between these three periods and see how this uh, uh, short period of uh, the Soviet uh, state making in the South Caucasus really fits into a bigger uh, picture. And this is the first time I'm trying to uh, put it in a wider context, so I would uh, be uh, really, it would be very helpful to get some feedback whether this really works or uh, it doesn't really work. So I'll start with uh, a question why uh, the boundaries are uh, important. Uh, uh, let's see if I got it correctly. Uh, well, uh, when, when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, in uh, 91, uh, all this uh, region was engulfed by, can we turn the light on? Yeah. All this region was engulfed by the whole bunch of uh, violent conflicts, uh, uh, which were quite unexpected uh, by many of the Western scholars. Like the Soviet Union was seen by majority of people as a one a homogeneous red spot on a map, and then suddenly it collapses and all this conflict starts to emerge. So people start asking questions, okay, why do we have all these problems? And very quickly, uh, if you look at the historiography, you will see uh, already in 93, uh, you have uh, collections of essays and uh, collections of articles appearing that are dealing with these issues. And one of these uh, issues is uh, basically attributing conflicts to uh, purposeful manipulation of the boundaries. Uh, I will kind of very briefly look at uh, this map we have uh, outlined in red the three areas which were engulfed by the conflicts uh, as the Soviet Union was disintegrating and uh, immediately after it collapsed. So you look at this map and you see that these areas of conflicts were uh, created as autonomous regions. And if you look at the uh, previous map, uh, you immediately see how different the region was. This is a snapshot of uh, South Caucasus under the Russian rule just before the beginning of the uh, First World War, and you can see how different it is uh, from uh, the Soviet one. So it's very logical to uh, attribute uh, the Soviet uh, state making and boundary making uh, uh, to the explanation of this conflict. So basically the logic is the Bolsheviks really did a, a messy job there. They created certain things on purpose uh, in order to uh, re-establish their control over this uh, area and this region. So that's, uh, that's the main uh, logic of this uh, initial works that started to appear in the 90s. I think there were approximately five uh, volumes, believe it or not, five volumes uh, dealing uh, with uh, the question of boundaries uh, in the South Caucasus, either directly or indirectly. <coughs> now, the way I kind of want to uh, approach this uh, approach this is uh, when you look at this map, uh, it's not very clear how do we uh, deal with these conflicts, how do we try to understand them. Uh, my uh, way to uh, deal with it was uh, to try to uh, uh, separate two different processes that were at play when the, uh, the boundaries were being created. I will call one uh, level an allocation tier and the other level I would call it a delimitation tier. What do I mean by that? <coughs> Uh, by allocation tier, I mean uh, when this region collapsed uh, after the uh, disintegration of Tsarist Empire, there was a period of approximately two and three years of uh, independence and conflicts being uh, fought between different uh, emerging republics. Then the Bolsheviks come in 1920, 1921. They establish their authority and uh, uh, basically create uh, the new states and establish new boundaries. So uh, within this period, I want to understand when the decision was taken and when uh, the decision was implemented on the ground. <coughs> so 
So if we look uh, at uh, uh, the allocation tier, the Bolsheviks, uh, uh, you will see it's, it's happening uh, rather quickly. So they capture Azerbaijan in uh, April 1920. Uh, towards then, they uh, established Soviet power in uh, Armenia. And in February 1921, they uh, uh, captured Georgia. So it's uh, approximately shorter than a year, uh, and they established their control over this region that was uh, fighting uh, very violent ethnic wars for the previous couple of years. Uh, within uh, literally a month, they uh, stabilized their external frontier. They signed a uh, peace treaty with uh, Turkish Republic, and uh, the, qu uh, the question of uh, the boundaries uh, between Soviet uh, South Caucasus and Turkey is being uh, resolved. Now, they have the control of the, over an entire region, but they have a problem because all these guys were fighting each other for uh, approximately three years, and the frontiers are not very clear between them. So how do you decide it? And I think uh, at this point we have uh, a situation where the Bolshevik leadership basically had this region under their own control. This is their own state, uh, and they want to solve the problems as soon as possible. They are not really planned long-term uh, goals right now. They want to stabilize the region. They want to establish their full control over it. So what happens in this period, uh, we need to uh, realize that uh, we need to realize that uh, even so the Bolsheviks have this uh, image of being a, a superpower, a tyrannical uh, power in a way, uh, they didn't have a complete control over what was going on. They were uh, very much dependent on a lot of forces on, on the ground. They depended on cooperation of the local elites. They depended on uh, uh, their own uh, decision making that was taking place uh, during the conquest of this region. So during the conquest of uh, the South Caucasus, the Bolshevik leadership, uh, in order to uh, get their uh, position into this region, uh, they made uh, the whole number of promises to different countries on the ground uh, in order to advance their position. So, for example, they promised uh, Azerbaijan that uh, they will be backing their territorial claims, and they were backing these territorial claims. But then, at some point, they needed to uh, promote the Sovietization of Armenia, so they kind of abandoned Azerbaijani claim, and they start promoting Armenian claims. The logic is that Azerbaijanis, you got so much so far, but now we have to bring Soviet power to Soviet Armenia, and we need uh, to basically uh, follow the party discipline and uh, fall in and uh, kind of compromise here. The same goes on in Georgia. So they basically, during the conquest of a region, they made a whole bunch of promises that were very often contradictory. So they promised uh, one territory to one guy, another territory, the same territory to the other guys, and uh, all this was done is in a very short, uh, 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 in a way to solve a very short uh, problems. Like literally sometimes uh, the problems they were solving was a couple months uh, issue. Not long-term strategy, very short-term strategy. For example, they uh, uh, captured uh, Georgia, but they found uh, that uh, the Bolsheviks that were capturing Abkhazia uh, were actually doing it completely separately from the Bolsheviks that were capturing the Georgian capital, Tiflis. As a result, they had claims by the Bolsheviks that captured Abkhazia saying, well, now we captured this territory, we're not really subordinated to the guys capturing the Georgian capital, why don't we proclaim our independence? So they have to solve this kind of problems. I mean, you have the same Bolsheviks capturing Abkhazia and the same Bolsheviks capturing Tiflis, and they start quarreling with each other. How do you do? How do you deal with these problems? So the uh, solution in Abkhazia was quite unusual because uh, what they did, uh, they told the Abkhaz guys, uh, let's do this, uh, let, let's do the following. You will declare complete independence of Georgia, and Georgia will recognize this independence. But then, because you are all members of the Communist Party, and you follow the discipline of the Communist Party, you will start working with the Abkhazian uh, population and peasants uh, towards uh, changing their mood towards independence, and then you will declare uh, that you are joining back to Georgia. So you can see here how they are uh, trying to uh, satisfy really completely different uh, approaches that existed within uh, uh, 
allegedly unified communist party. So they are basically solving conflicts. I mean, I know it's, uh, this sounds uh, pretty ridiculous that the Bolsheviks are solving conflicts, but these guys are solving conflicts, really, in these, uh, in these uh, situations. So then the time comes for the Abkhazians to uh, make good of their uh, promise that they will join Georgia. And these guys, they have a taste of independence, and they do everything possible not to go back to Georgia. So the Bolshevik leadership is now presented with a dilemma that these guys uh, are not following their orders. So how do we deal with it? So they start forcing them uh, into a union with Georgia, but they want to do it in a very legal way. It's very interesting that uh, uh, these guys who were uh, quite tyrannical in a way, they are very careful about having uh, everything on the paper to look uh, very smooth and neat and authorized, etc., etc., etc. So they're pushing these guys into legally uh, administering uh, resignation of their independence, and uh, basically they want the Abkhaz parliament uh, to declare that they want to join Georgia, etc., etc., etc. And then suddenly, uh, they completely abandoned this project of the Abkhazians uh, uh, doing this in a legal way, and they forced them a couple months before they're supposed to do it in a legal way, in a parliamentary uh, environment. They forced them into union with Georgia without all these legal procedures. Why? Why would they do that? Why uh, They were pushing these guys for like several months into a proper procedure of uh, doing it, and the very last moment they completely abandoned it. And I'll explain it a bit later. Uh, very similar things are happening with, let's say, Karabakh. Karabakh was uh, promised to Armenia, I think, four or five times, and eventually they uh, decided to give it to uh, Azerbaijan. Again, if you look at the case study, uh, it appears that they are basically uh, solving very short-term problems. They're not thinking long-term. But then, when they captured this region in uh, uh, 1921, uh, uh, by March, uh, everything is under their control. They are basically presented with this complete mess uh, that came under their control, and they have to uh, solve these issues. So they made a lot of promises. They don't have enough uh, uh, forces to impose their uh, unconditional will, and they have all these local elites uh, who are basically competing for their attention. So they have all these uh, three issues, and they have to solve the problems because the borders are not clear. So what happens then, uh, they, uh, again, I'm uh, going to uh, do a very big shortcut here. The solution, the way I understand it, was uh, that these guys decided, well, we cannot really force uh, whatever we uh, see suitable. Well, I mean, I'm not going to get into Bolshevik ideology, but in a, as a very big shortcut, uh, they were thinking that, well, we have to, at this point, kind of do uh, make some concessions to the nationality feeling because this is an inevitable process of uh, historical development, so we cannot just uh, jump over it. So the idea was you have to solve these uh, interethnic uh, problems and issues by uh, making some uh, concessions to the minority groups. But they cannot do these concessions because they are uh, in, uh, they're completely stuck in this uh, a swamp of their previous decisions, of the local powers competing. So eventually the decisions they make is a compromise. It's a compromise that doesn't satisfy neither power. It doesn't satisfy republics. It doesn't satisfy the minority groups. The compromise is whoever controls the territory uh, at the moment uh, uh, when the Bolsheviks came to the region will uh, continue to control it. So for example, in practical terms, uh, Azerbaijan controlled the disputed territory uh, uh, between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan Karabakh, so Azerbaijan will get Karabakh. But in order to kind of uh, sweeten up the pill for the Armenians, we shall give them uh, autonomous status. The same thing goes for uh, South Ossetia, uh, which is which is this one. Again, uh, the Georgian state controlled this region de facto but there were continuous ethnic tensions and problems, so the solution was Georgians keep it, but you have to give them autonomy. And the same thing goes for Abkhazia, as uh, I just described, they got independence, but on condition that they will say we don't need this independence, we had had enough of it, we want to join Georgia. So that was, uh, in a way, a decision of uh, how did they do it. Now, the second one, uh, uh, 
Now, this, this period was completed very quickly within, uh, uh, nine, within several, half a year of 1921, all the delimitation allocation decisions are being made. So very quickly they decide who controls what. But then we have uh, another tier, uh, another level of decision making. Once you decided, well, you control this territory, now you have to determine the boundaries of this territory. And this is a very long process as a, as a contrast to this rather quick process. So for example, uh, South Ossetia uh, gets uh, their decision in April 1922. This is the fastest decision. Uh, took approximately seven, eight months from the moment they uh, decide that these guys uh, deserve to have their autonomous status until they were uh, finally proclaimed. Karabakh is an interesting case. It took much longer, approximately three to four years to determine its boundaries. Now, once you start looking what's going on on the ground uh, in these uh, situations, you start realizing that there is a very, uh, I don't want to say nasty, but uh, very, well, let's say nasty. Very nasty struggle going on between the republic and the minority groups. So the republic doesn't want to give them autonomy. They do everything possible not to give them autonomy. And the minority groups are uh, appealing to Moscow and central authorities saying, well, uh, there were some promises. And Moscow eventually intervenes and uh, forces them to uh, give autonomy. Now, my question here is there is a discrepancy between uh, uh, level one and level two. On level one, they kind of made completely opposite promises, uh, and they were quite flexible who gets what. They, as I said, they promised Karabakh to Armenians five times and eventually gave it to Azerbaijan. Uh, with Abkhazia as well, you can be independent, then you cannot be independent, etc., etc., etc. And here, it's strange enough, but they are very, very firm in uh, their decision make uh, in their decision to force. Uh, the implementation of uh, the previous decision. I was wondering why. I mean, they were quite flexible before. Why can't they be flexible now? Why can't they uh, say to the Republic, well, I mean, you put up a really strong resistance. We give up. Uh, we're not going to go ahead with minority group. The only way uh, to understand it, I think, is uh, if they uh, backed uh, down in this case, that would undermine their authority. That would undermine their authority was these minority groups and with the republics. So the republics will have no respect for Moscow authority. The minority groups can uh, start uh, making problems and troubles, et cetera, et cetera. That's my understanding why they were uh, implementing it. So if we uh, were to summarize uh, what I said so far, uh, I don't think uh, by looking at the decision-making process here, we can say that uh, uh, these boundaries these, these boundaries were drawn on purpose with a long-term uh, goal of uh, setting uh, some groups against the other groups. I, I don't know how convincing I was, but I hope it was convincing enough to show you that uh, the process that leading to, the, uh, to this outcome was not a linear process. It was uh, basically a response to very short uh, challenges that were arising. And I think this is true of many decision-making processes, not only here, but uh, in, let's say, American politics or Russian politics nowadays and other cases. Now, the other question is, uh, uh, people should usually say, hold on a second, but the Bolsheviks are economic animals, aren't they? You know, it's everything uh, about Marx and it's about the economy. And how about this, all these decisions are based on economic logic? Forget about them doing a uh, long-term uh, uh, setting a divide and rule goal, but how about economic logic here? And if you look at this map, you will see that economic logic actually blends really well into this argument. Uh, I put this map because it shows the uh, uh, geophysical characteristics of this region, and you can see that, let's say, Karabakh and South Ossetia, they really integrate very well with their respective republics. Like, South Ossetia has uh, the highest mountains in Europe, separating it from Russia and North Ossetia. So all economic activity is focused towards Georgia. There is no question that they will be uh, doing any economic whatever with the uh, uh, North Ossetians across the Caucasian mountains. Look at Karabakh. Karabakh, again, faces uh, towards uh, uh, Azerbaijan, towards Kura River. Again, 
if you look at uh, the boundary with Armenia, you have very high mountains, which at that time were pretty much impassable. So all economic activity in Karabakh is uh, focused uh, and directed towards uh, lowland Azerbaijan. So in a way, yeah, you can say economic uh, argument uh, holds here. Uh, my problem with this is if you look at the process when the decisions were uh, being made, the decision-making process when they were deciding uh, who gets what and uh, when the boundaries were drawn, the economic feature practically doesn't, uh, the economic question doesn't feature in the discussions. It only emerges at a very crucial moment when the decision is about to be taken. So my understanding is these guys very quickly learned how to use the Bolshevik uh, narrative, uh, the logic, and they were starting implementing it in a very right moment. Because otherwise, if this was an economic issue, you would have a lot of uh, economic kind of questions popping up in the archives surrounding this decision-making area. They only appear at the very key moment when the decision is being taken. So my understanding is these guys just learned that these guys are you know, concerned with economics, so why don't we use this economic logic in a very right uh, way? And I think you will find it uh, a lot in the post-Soviet Union. A lot of people learned uh, about human rights and now start using the human rights discourse because this is what the Americans and Europeans like to hear. So that's pretty much uh, the same uh, process. <coughs> uh, but there is, I have a better argument uh, to undermine the economic, uh, how should I say, uh, the economic argument for the drawing these boundaries. Uh, number one is, if this was an economic logic uh, drawing these boundaries, then it would make no, it would make much more sense not to create these autonomies at all, because these boundaries are cutting exactly across the lines of economic activity. So look at the Karabakh. Karabakh is uh, being cut out of this ec larger economic unit. The same with South Ossetia. Its boundary is basically cutting across the lines of economic activity between the Ossetians living in the mountains and Georgians living in lowlands. So I would say, why would they create the boundaries in the first place? Because it's cutting against uh, economic logic. The other question is, if you are applying economic logic in this case, then uh, we have a very nice case of, let's say, this area, which is called Zangezur, uh, which is given to Armenia. It doesn't have much of an economic uh, linkage with Armenia. Uh, it's, uh, it had been connected much better to, let's say, territories of Azerbaijan. So they are giving this territory completely against any economic logic. How about these guys here? This is Nahichevan. Again, Nahichevan has pretty much all the economic activity directed towards Armenia and none to Azerbaijan. So if you try to uh, look at the economic logic, I don't think uh, it uh, really works. Now, my another question is, so does it really mean that uh, the Bolsheviks didn't care about economics? I don't think uh, it does mean that, but I think uh, uh, you have to look at the bigger picture in terms of their economic thinking. They didn't uh, look at this region as a uh, region divided into these uh, three republics and autonomous regions. They saw it as a one big economic unit of the South Caucasus. And that's what they started to do very quickly in 1922, beginning of 1922. They started to force all these three republics into uh, a union of, I forgot the exact term of it, uh, but it was a uh, Transcaucasian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, which existed until 36. So they were thinking in a bigger uh, economic terms. They did not think in terms of republic or autonomy. They didn't really care about the Ossetians growing up potatoes or Karabakh Armenians growing up uh, the wine, uh, uh, the grapes, etc. Et they were thinking in a bigger terms, the bigger region. And here comes uh, our Abkhazian case. Remember I said, the Abkhazians were forced uh, to completely abandon all this uh, legal process, uh, which was uh, looking very neat on a paper. You know, they were about to uh, 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 give up their uh, independence uh, in an official way, and then suddenly they do it in an official way. And when you compare this uh, uh, decision-making with what was going on on a bigger scale, 
uh, which is they were forcing three republics into Transcaucasian Federation. Uh, that fits into this logic. They needed to show Georgians, who were putting up a lot of resistance towards uh, being forced into this economic uh, unit, they needed to show Georgians that they actually do something for Georgia. And forcing the Abkhaz into union with Georgia was one of these things. So that's why they forced the Abkhaz uh, to uh, resign, uh, to give up their independence, and uh, the Abkhaz joined into union with Georgia uh, just in time for them to sign the economic uh, treaty between all three republics. That fits, a, uh, fits into the uh, time pattern uh, of the decision-making. Decision <clears throat> I hope I uh, managed to convince you that, uh, how many years is it? Three, four years of the decision-making the Bolsheviks uh, spent uh, in this region were not motivated by their desire to create long-term problems. Even so, if you compare these two maps, it does look like this, is, uh, this, this has been designed on purpose uh, in order to uh, kind of uh, cater for some uh, sin sinister goals. Now, what I want to do right now <coughs> is uh, to situate all this a very short period, very dense period, uh, 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 extremely eventful period in a wider uh, context of let's say, Russian advance into the South Caucasus and the Soviet experiences uh, uh, in this region. <sighs> I'm running out of time, so I'll kind of uh, try to be uh, precise. Uh, my main argument is that the Russian Empire uh, appears in the South Caucasus from the beginning of 19th century, and it appeared in a very specific moment in history. They appear at a moment when the world is experiencing uh, a very uh, important social, uh, economic, and uh, uh, ethnic, not ethnic, but you know what I mean, uh, changes. This is, this is a period when uh, the Russian uh, Empire is a European imperial power that is bringing completely new to this region. Uh, they are a new player uh, uh, along with two traditional uh, players of this region, with uh, Ottoman Empire and Iran, but they are different. They are European powers. They have very precise vision of how they're going to administer this region. And this is very, very different from uh, what the Iranians uh, saw, how the Iranians saw this region and how the Ottomans saw this region. These guys, these two empires, traditionally had uh, been ruling this region through indirect rule. So basically, these guys uh, living in the South Caucasus uh, run their own internal affairs as they were pleased to run, as long as they were uh, loyal to their overlords in uh, Iran or Ottoman Empire and paid taxes. They were allowed to run their internal affairs pretty much uh, unrestrained. When the Russians appear, they're not happy with that. They are not happy at all, and they are undertaking a very large program of uh, reincorporation of this region into the uh, norms and standards of the Russian Empire. So literally within 40 years, the region experiences a centralization it never experienced before. In uh, two or three thousand history uh, of this region, they never experienced a centralization like that. The Russians start to undermine uh, the local uh, loyalties. They completely erase uh, the local principalities uh, to such an extent that even they changed the names uh, of the provinces so that it doesn't remind uh, the population there of what was used to be there. And they are very successful in undermining these loyalties. Here is a map of the region at the beginning of the Russian conquest, and you can see here uh, not one Georgia, but approximately four or five different Georgias. You look at the Azerbaijan, uh, you will see half a dozen of uh, principalities here. Within 40, 50 years, all this was gone. All this was erased and transformed into a Russian uh, imperial unit. The population was fused together in a way. Uh, they uh, no longer were associating themselves with uh, uh, the uh, political units that existed there, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there, uh, I found that there are three, uh, three types of effects the Russian uh, imperial advance into this region had on the population. Number one was they were quite, quite successful in undermining uh, the uh, loyalties of the population to what existed before here. Number two, they had a failure. 
they had a very, very big failure. They failed to colonize it. They tried. There were some attempts. They were encouraging uh, peasants from Russia to come and settle here. They were giving very generous uh, conditions for these peasants, but they never managed to colonize it. There are different reasons, environmental, uh, economic reasons, but the Russians never managed to uh, uh, infiltrate the region in sufficient numbers to tip the balance. The other problem was uh, uh, related to the first one, to their success in undermining the loyalties. The reason they were undermining the loyalties, they wanted to uh, move these people away from association with, let's say, Iran or association with uh, Ottoman Empire, and they were quite successful in that. But they failed to integrate them into the bigger Russian uh, kind of uh, milieu of uh, society or identity. Instead of making them into Russians, they created a completely new set of identities in this region. Remember, there were four Georgias or five Georgias. By removing all these principalities, they made the conditions possible for the Georgians to see themselves as a one bigger nation. The same happened in Azerbaijan. By removing all these uh, principalities, uh, they were again successful in undermining the loyalty to principality. But in the long term, they managed to uh, uh, create an emerging identity among the Muslim population of the South Caucasus. They also brought a large number of Armenians and settled them in uh, this uh, southern part of the region, <coughs> uh, making uh, uh, a nucleus of a would-be Armenian state. So again, all these policies that were pursued in order to colonize and integrate this region uh, created a completely new set of outcomes than uh, was initially intended. Again, towards the second half of 19th century, we have uh, uh, capitalism penetrating into this region, and uh, that uh, creates a lot of uh, tensions uh, social tension, but these social tensions in this uh, region are very often coinciding with ethnic tensions and ethnic uh, differences between the people. So I'm again skipping a lot of here, uh, but I just want to say that uh, as a result of development of capitalism, you have an uh, accelerated process of identities emerging uh, among the population uh, of this region. One kind of footnote, uh, not directly related to what I'm saying right now, but uh, if I have time, I'll kind of uh, look back on it. The Russians did another thing. <coughs> uh, like all good imperialists, uh, they created uh, the alphabet for the guys who didn't have a literary language. Now, the reason was not completely sincere to develop them, but the reason was they wanted to, my, my interpretation, they wanted to uh, undermine the Georgian uh, cultural domination uh, in these areas by creating a, a Russian-based, Cyrillic-based alphabet for, let's say, Ossetians and Abkhazians, because the Abkhazians and the Ossetians were using the Georgian as a, as a language of communication. And by creating their own alphabet, the Russians were undermining it. The Georgians were very, very uh, uneasy about this Russian cultural penetration, and they saw it as infringement upon the Georgian culture. So even so, these people were not Georgians, these people didn't speak Georgian, but they used Georgian as a language of communication. And the Russians uh, creating them alphabets and uh, replacing Georgian with the Russian language was uh, very uh, ill-perceived by uh, the Georgians. I'll uh, try to get back to this uh, question later on. <coughs> so when in 1917 the Tsarist Empire collapsed, and this re region completely separated from Tsarist Empire and became independent, we have a question of uh, legacy here. And I would argue that uh, even so we're accustomed to uh, seeing Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia as pretty much a legitimate uh, entities in this region, they have as much legitimacy as everyone else in this region because their legitimacy comes from the Tsarist period. Just like the legitimacy of the Abkhazians, legitimacy of the Ossetians or Karabakh Armenians, this uh, region was not, uh, it's not like a sleeping beauty that fell asleep in, in 1801 and then woke up 100 years later in the same condition. Things have changed on the ground. Things have dramatically changed on the ground. And these guys were dealing with this new, completely new situation that uh, emerged after 116 or something years of Tsarist rule. So that's what they were dealing with in these two years of uh, independence, two or three years of independence. 
And then the Bolsheviks come and they are basically dealing with the consequences of these guys trying to solve out their differences uh, over uh, this couple of years that were resulting from the 100 years of the Russian rule. Now, the Bolsheviks were not in this region for these three years to kind of do all these decisions. What they doing, what I was trying to say they were doing, they were simply uh, confronted with all this mess that uh, these guys created. I mean, they were actually calling this a complete mess. Uh, and they were trying to find some solutions to this. And the solutions were, uh, you know, very patchy solutions, very ad hoc solutions, very quickly uh, adopted solutions. Basically, you have to stop fighting, you have to stop killing each other. Okay, you have this territory, you get this territory. So that's the story I was uh, starting it with. And now, we had, at the very beginning, we had conflicts in the Caucasus, and conflicts come uh, in later, in the 90s. So I want, I have like, what, seven minutes? Okay. So I want to now look at how these uh, all things were developing in a Soviet period. It's another installment. It's very interesting because the independence is situated more or less uh, evenly between these very long installments of uh, Russian rule, 116 years of Tsarist rule, and then 70 years of the Soviet rule. So this period really serves as a connecting point between the two. And what I kind of noticed and what Catherine just said at the very beginning, you kind of gave, uh, gave away uh, some of the things, yeah. Uh, basically, uh, you look at uh, work that deals with this region during the independence, it kind of completely isolates it from what is going on afterwards and what is going on before that. I, uh, I actually would use the word insulates it rather than isolates it. It kind of builds this uh, layer of uh, protection. So we're only dealing with independence and the Soviets come and take this independence away. And what's going on afterwards is not clear. And what was going on before is not clear. How they merge together and uh, connect together is again being left aside. Because independence is uh, such a big issue for uh, minority groups who were uh, left uh, very often abroad. So a very traumatic issue, I think, that comes from uh, these uh, uh, experiences. And again, this thing about legitimacy and legacy uh, again creeps in somehow. Uh, everybody thinks that Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia are legitimate entities, and the rest is not a legitimate. They have as much legitimacy as, every, as everybody else, because their legitimacy comes from the experiences of 100 years of a Tsarist rule and what the Tsarist rule did in this region, and not only bad things, but good things. Uh, so you have, you know, on a balance, I don't know on the balance. I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, so what, what I'm trying to say here is, again, this independence is, is very much isolated from uh, the rest of it. And that comes to the Soviet period. Now, the Bolsheviks, <coughs> the Bolsheviks uh, basically, uh, once they stabilize the situation in the region, uh, they have this uh, period of uh, romanticism, approximately 10 years when they were torn with this idea, we're going to give all these minority groups uh, their kind of cultural uh, rights, develop their cultures, and all this nationalism will go uh, disappear because we kind of encourage it, it's, it, it will be done with it. And then they realize, well, it's not exactly going away, uh, and uh, so they start uh, tightening the system up. The system starts to tighten up in the 30s. Uh, all this uh, cultural production that the minorities and union republics are producing is declining, but it never disappeared. It never completely disappeared. They never dismantled uh, the system that existed there. So this system survived, uh, even so they didn't publish any books or any articles or any cultural production, but the institutions that were responsible for that were still there. So when, uh, and plus uh, there were some uh, not very nice things going on in a Stalinist period, in particular in Georgia, because the Georgians had this uh, moment when uh, with the support of Beria, they could actually get back to what they considered uh, to be uh, illegitimately taken from them by the Russian Tsarism. Which goes back to my point about the alphabets and literacy and literary traditions. So what happens here? The Georgians are trying to reinstate, my interpretation is that they were trying to reinstate what they lost in 19th century. They uh, 
fourth of the Georgian uh, script alphabet on Abkhazians. They do the same for the Ossetians, so you have a very kind of curious situation. The Ossetians in the South Ossetia would be writing in Georgian characters, while Ossetians in the North Ossetia would be writing in Cyrillic characters. Same nation, speak the same language, but two different alphabets. My understanding is they're not uh, like the present day interpretation is they wanted to assimilate us. But I think it's related to 19th century uh, cultural uh, hegemony of the Georgian language as a language of communication among the elites in the city and uprising. And I think that's related to this. They were trying to uh, get back uh, what they lost to the Russian Empire. It didn't go very well uh, with these minority groups. Uh, so when Stalin died, when Beria was shot, when Khrushchev had to relax the system, all these grievances start appearing. And how do you deal with this? Well, Khrushchev's approach was, well, we have to heal these grievances. So the minority groups, in a very Soviet way, were allowed to, let's say, uh, I don't want to say flourish, but celebrate their uh, culture and identity and et cetera, et cetera. So you have a period of explosion in the number of books or cultural products being manufactured in, uh, in these two regions. Uh, in Armenia as well, not so much in Karabakh, uh, but people were using this opportunity to uh, put forward their grievances, to address uh, their uh, identity issues. So basically what happens uh, in the 60s, uh, you have a very limited uh, nationalist discourse being accepted by the Soviet authorities. As long as you don't say the Russians are the bad guys or the Soviet Union is wrong, you can actually, you know, bite uh, outsiders, Turks preferably, for the Armenians, or very carefully each other, but very, very carefully. So you have this uh, nationalism creeping in, uh, which is sort of tolerated by the Soviet uh, authorities. And then, uh, this is again important, because the group is very unimportant, but it becomes important later on, uh, you have dissidents. Now, dissidents are, it's a big deal in the West. You know, we all have Solzhenitsyn, my students read Solzhenitsyn, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But within the Soviet Union, these guys were minority. They didn't have access, they didn't have uh, ability to influence a very large proportion of the population. They were, uh, in in, uh, they were put in jail, uh, they were shut up, they were expelled into the West. So the large Soviet public didn't get these guys. But what these guys were saying, they were not happy with the... Uh, uh, limited nationalism that was permitted in the Soviet Union, they were saying much more uh, challenging things to the Soviet regime. And once the Soviet regime started to oppress them, they became much more radical. So what uh, happens in a nationalist discourse that was put forward by the dissidents, they start to completely reject any Soviet legacy or legitimacy. So for these guys, the Soviet Union was totally, completely unacceptable and illegal and had to be dismantled. Uh, and uh, basically, they had to, uh, to go back to uh, 1918 when they had uh, independence completely. Now, again, these guys were quite marginalized within Soviet Union. But then we have 70s. We have uh, Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, uh, who couldn't speak properly on a TV. Uh, economic uh, situation in the Soviet Union starts to deteriorate. People are asking questions. How comes uh, we see all this, uh, the West uh, going down the hill, and we don't, uh, we don't have an opportunity to buy some furniture? We are the most developed uh, socialist country. How comes we don't have all this? So eventually what happens, uh, people are beginning to doubt the Soviet leadership. The Soviet leadership starts to appear impotent and incompetent. And then Comrade Gorbachev comes and realizes something needs to be done and uh, starts all this process of democratization. But this process of democratization starts at the very moment when the Soviet economy collapses, when the majority of population is losing any trust with their leadership. So at this very moment, these dissidents who were saying all these years that the Soviet Union is totally illegitimate and illegal, and uh, we have to dismantle it, they become uh, the voice of a prophet in a way. They become accepted. And once these guys became accepted, uh, they basically started to put forward their agenda. And their agenda was, we have to dismantle the Soviet past. And part of the dismantling of the Soviet past was all, all these autonomies, all these borders are illegal. 
Now, when they were dismantling the Soviet uh, past, they were dismantling their own republics in a way, because their own republics were coming from this uh, 19th century legacy left by the Tsarist Empire that was, uh, in a way, fixed by the Soviet Union in the 20s. So when in the 90s they were tearing it apart, they were really tearing apart their own republics. And that's uh, my argument uh, that actually if you look in a bigger picture, connect the 19th century with uh, 20th century through this uh, period of independence, you get a, a completely different picture. Not the Soviet Union creating boundaries on purpose to uh, set the people against each other, but it's a longer process of uh, this region uh, experiencing through 19th century and 20th century, exposure to modernity, exposure to uh, social transformation, literacy. Uh, when in 19th century Russians came to this region, all these peasants were paying taxes by, you know, you have to pay, I don't know, 10 ships a year for these landlords. Nobody was writing. When the whole thing collapsed, the writing was very important. And then suddenly it becomes important in more language writing. So all these things kind of uh, blended together, and uh, eventually we have uh, we have the conflicts uh, reemerging in uh, uh, twenty tw at the end of the twentieth century. Thank you very much. Very informative lecture. Would you like to field your own question? Uh, uh, well, I mean, actually, if you could. <laughs> Or somebody. I could yeah. Oh. Yes. Um, you were talking about principalities prior to the uh, Russian Empire uh, dominating. Could you just briefly sort of tell me what a principality is and what was the basis of the type of government they had? And were these different principalities? Uh, what kind of relationships did they have? Were they good? Were they uh, well, I mean, uh, we had two Georgian, three Georgian kingdoms, uh, and uh, a number of Georgian principalities. These were Christian guys. Part of them were uh, part, technically part of the Ottoman Empire. Part of them were part of uh, Safavid uh, Empire, Iranian Empire. Oh, okay. Then we had a lot of Muslim principalities in eastern uh, South Caucasus, which were again uh, ruled by their rulers, and the relationship was when the central power in Iran was strong enough, they were very loyal, but as soon as uh, it disintegrates or collapses, these guys kind of assert their own independence, they make their principalities hereditary, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. I'm just wondering, with Russification of the 19th century, I don't know that much about imperial matters, and the use of the Russian language, what effect I'm a living example of it. Well, I'm just saying, curious. Is you? I noticed the really. What was the Georgian alphabet? Was it Latin based on Latin? No, it's a, it's a unique uh, alphabet uh, uh, with unique characters. Based uh, on, on uh, uh, similar to. Uh, uh, I don't want to say similar to what, <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it's quite unique. Uh, basically, I don't think anyone else has the same alphabet, oh, okay. just like Armenians. If you look at the Soviet experience, very good question. Uh, if you look at the Soviet experience, on a paper, uh, the way it appears, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. 
whether you are in Armenia or in Azerbaijan or in Karabakh. So you cross these boundaries without anybody asking your papers uh, or uh, having any taxes to pay import or export duties. But what really matters is you have a central authority sitting in the capital, okay. and these guys are deciding on economic things. They're deciding who can uh, live in this territory. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the Soviet Union is an uh, uh, area where you have registration, you have prapiska. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people cannot move. You cannot decide, I want to go to Moscow and live in Moscow. Mm -hmm. You have to have registration. So you have, in a way, boundaries. Uh, uh, on a Physically, you don't feel them. But once you want to move to a certain area to live, you then come in contact with the authorities who are in charge, who are in charge of these boundaries. So they can decide who can, who can come and live there, who cannot come and live there, uh, uh, what kind of policies we're pursuing. Are we developing this village or are we not developing this other village? Because this is falling within our uh, legislation, not legislation. Well, you know, it falls within our uh, territory with jurisdiction, jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Uh, so it's not your business. You cannot come and, uh, you know, start building houses here. Yeah. It's us. Those are real boundaries. Yeah. yeah. So they're not physical, but they're there. Uh, my, my understanding, and they ask this question very often to, let's say, their own government, my understanding is that <laughs> they, they didn't uh, 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 create a mess, they were quiet, uh, and that's why they didn't get anything. So if you are naughty and if you start causing trouble and uh, fighting and all these things, then they start wondering, okay, how can we solve it? These guys didn't do anything like that, so they were quiet, so why, why would you give them? Thanks. Thank you. I have a question about the border of Nakhichevan and Armenia. I know that the use of Nakhichevan was separately in the city of Kars, Moscow and Kars in 1921. But was the border already clear at that time, or the decision on the border was uh, later? The border was uh, part of the treaty itself, like the border is being described. But I know that in the uh, Soviet period during the 20s, uh, there were some changes to this boundary. But I don't know why they were taking place and how they were taking place. Can I just introduce a, a question before we move on to your second question? We had some interesting questions as well. I'm curious about the ad hoc pictures that you paint of the Bolsheviks and their early intervention, at least, or concern about um, frontier making and ethnic um, ethnicity in Caucasus, and I was wondering, first of all, who are these? Who are these people who they sent, right? And if you compare to the Central Asian frontiers, how differently, or does it confirm um, this assertion that you make, or is it um, is it different on the Central Asia versus the Caucasus? Uh, the Bolsheviks uh, who were dealing with this region, most of them uh, were actually coming from this region. Uh, so they were ethnic Georgians, ethnic uh, Armenians, or uh, Azerbaijani. There were some Russians as well. Uh, but uh, in terms of their identity, these guys were socialists. There was no question of them being nationalists, not at this point. It comes, the nationalism comes in later. Now, the local guys uh, on the ground uh, who were interacting with the population, they had to take into account what the population was uh, uh, wishing and desiring. So here you have the decision makers, the small group of decision makers, were probably quite isolated uh, in terms of uh, their nationalist uh, feelings or identity. But the guys in the middle who were dealing with the population and uh, with their superiors in uh, the delegates from the Moscow, they probably had to take these desires into account. And these guys eventually had to take it into account as well. Now, if we compare it to Central Asia, uh, it's not my region. But from what I'm uh, uh, figuring out, there are big differences here and in Central Asia. Here you have a very clear 
conflicts uh, between ethnic groups. I mean, they didn't start as ethnic conflict. They started as a social conflict, but very quickly uh, uh, during the Civil War, they have this uh, transformation of ethnic grievances uh, being uh, supplanted by economic grievances being supplanted by ethnic grievances. So when they come, these are essentially ethnic conflicts. If you look at the Central Asia, the picture is different. You have a lot of people who don't yet have this uh, very clear uh, uh, sense of ethnic identity. I'm sorry. Uh, in a way, you have a replication of a situation with the Talish or Lesgins. These guys don't uh, completely feel themselves all that different from this bigger Muslim uh, population of Eastern South Caucasus. Uh, in Central Asia, you have very similar picture where you have all these uh, ethnic groups who do not yet identify themselves with uh, nationality or ethnicity. And the Soviet state uh, start this process of making them into uh, different ethnic groups by encouraging and developing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the differences in my uh, understanding of how Caucasus is different from the rest of it. When, when now coming from the other side, uh, it, m it might be just good to also consider that we see, you know, of course, modernity in the 19th, 19th century and centralization echoes also in the Ottoman Empire and the other empires. So in, in, that, in that time, that maybe actually uh, another nuance that, yep. that, yep. that would contribute yep. to yep. Yeah, yeah, what I wanted to say actually, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm doing a lot of whitewashing of the Russians and the Bolsheviks here. But what I wanted to say here, if it were the Ottomans who would have captured this region at the beginning of 19th century or Qajars, uh, you would have the same process going on because right now you don't have any principalities in Iran who are independent or in Ottoman Empire. So you would pretty much have the same process uh, taking place in this region under the other rulers. And the picture would obviously be different. But the Russians were first, they grabbed it, and this is 19th century when things are you know, changing at a tremendous pace. I mean, the, the whole Russian Empire didn't copy that they collapsed. My, this reference, uh, I don't want to deal with the present day situation per se, but uh, what I'm seeing from, uh, from this historical experience uh, in a nutshell is basically everything eventually is being decided by who controls what. So I'll, I'll stop at this point. So uh, you look, you look what happened before. Uh, uh, nothing, nothing is being uh, uh, kind of toned down or renegotiated. You know, whoever manages to grab something, they keep it. So that's how it worked. Uh, they exchanged uh, this uh, territory with Iran in the 20s to have a common border with Nahichuan. Uh, I had an article somewhere from the Western Journal, Geographic Journal in the 50s, and it was dealing with that. So it was uh, an exchange, territorial exchange. The, uh, uh, Turkey gave some uh, larger piece of land to Iran in exchange for uh, this uh, kind of uh, piece of land that would connect uh, Turkey to Nahichuan. Lack of what? Oh, colonization. Mm -hmm. Why, in, in part for Russia, in the 
uh, there were a lot of, uh, well, first of all, Russians didn't have a lot of uh, people who could be used for colonization. The second problem was uh, the climatic differences were very uh, significant. So uh, their attempts to colonize this region didn't work out very well because a lot of uh, the guys who came and settled, they started dying because of the diseases. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's really, really tremendous how many people were dying there. Uh, especially uh, in, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, Dagestan, there were a lot of, but uh, the same things was happening in uh, South Caucasus. I had a lecture, I think, a couple days ago uh, on uh, Peter the Great when they uh, tried to grab this region. Uh, uh, they were losing something like seven to 8,000 people a year. Out of this number, uh, 7,000 uh, something uh, were due to the diseases. So they were uh, losing like, I don't know, a couple of hundreds in fighting, a uh, couple of hundreds run away. The rest of uh, the seven, eight thousand were dying because of the diseases. So I think that played a very significant role why they didn't uh, manage. They tried to colonize Abkhazia, but they had problems because there were no roads. Uh, so eventually they kind of uh, did colonize it, but proportionately, uh, let's say Greeks and Armenians who were coming from the Ottoman Empire, from the Black Sea shore, they had a better uh, start because they were familiar with the climate, they were producing the same uh, uh, agricultural product as they were producing in Ottoman Empire, they had this advantage over Russians, even so the Russians were given bigger land and uh, uh, encouragement to settle there. <laughs>